currently at the MoMA. So I'm going to let him start our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, uh, Benita San Pedro and the organizers of uh, the conference. Um, I will uh, present a slideshow of a compilation of uh, images, um, archive material, also uh, pictures of uh, the project itself, and uh, like yeah, different kind of images which I'm used. But I'm gonna read my text, uh, so it's it's uh, just a compilation of images uh, from my art uh, artistic approach. Uh, I will describe uh, and introduce uh, the development of my artistic project, Flota en Fumo. The project started in 2006 as an investigation concerning cultural remembrance, the history and myth of the albino gorilla whose popular name was Snowflake, but also known in Spanish as Copito de Nieve, in Catalan as Floquet de Nieve, and in Fang as in Fumo. I spent several months in Barcelona and had two starting points for my investigation, the Barcelona Zoo and the Sabata Pi collection located at the Barcelona Science Park. The first part, uh, Bar uh, the Barcelona Zoo. Snowflake lived at the Barcelona Zoo from 1966 until his death in 2003. I was interested in existing memories, souvenirs, anecdotes, drawings, photos, and visual proof which could be represent the lifespan of Snowflake in the Barcelona Zoo. The education department and the research unit from the Barcelona Zoo explained to me that the Copito file was not yet archived and therefore not accessible. The only information they could offer me was a commercial DVD about Snowflake's life and the DVD El Nange de Bouchonant Floquet. It's Catalan for children drawings of Snowflake. Other information could be found at the Gorilla Space, a visitor's interpretation center for the public of the Barcelona Zoo. The permanent exhibition at the Gorilla Space was built and integrated in 2003. It explained Snowflake's history and the life of lowland gorillas, their habitats, environment, and patterns. The Gorilla Space is an attractive, well-documented, and informative multimedia center. And as the Copito website describes, it intends to inform the visitors about the world of gorilla, a species that shares around 98% of its DNA with humans and with which is in imminent danger of disappearing. Uh, I will tell more about the DVD El Nange de Bouchon en Floquet. In the last month of Snowflake's life, the Barcelona Zoo announced a campaign, a kind of homenage that was presented through all types of media across Spain and a part of this homenage was that children could get, free an, uh, could get a free entrance ticket to the Barcelona Zoo in exchange for a drawing dedicated to the albino gorilla snowflake. The Barcelona Zoo did not keep the original drawings and they have since been thrown away. The images of the drawings now only survive in archive through a DVD called El Nange de Bouchon en Floquet, made by the Barcelona Zoo. The DVD depicting a repetitive slideshow of the drawings accompanied with the sound of an African drum instrument. From my artist practice, I was interested in this entire collection of children drawings in order to study and observe the imaginations projected by the makers of the drawings. This is a kind of uh, collage that I made from all the, uh, the drawings. Uh, the child's projection in a drawing could give me some perspective about the relation between the city of Barcelona and the citizen's admiration of the albino gorilla. Perspectives about human-animal relations, about the perception towards zoological institutes in the 21st century, and towards nature conservation. The collection, revealing a lot of valuable information, was lost, as well as the traces of the authors from the drawings. One could read the drawings as animal monkey on paper, but a secondary, more deeply reading about Western values is the projection by a generation of children towards the topics mentioned above or even more interested. The small shift of making a DVD as a leftover from this whole campaign, uh, instead of storing the drawings in boxes, was for me a very, very important. 
The Barcelona Zoo had a strange, rather stereotypical behavior to deal with their archive collections and concepts. Um, the second part, uh, what I did in Barcelona, was uh, at the Sabater P collection. Uh, born in Barcelona, Jordi Sabater P worked in Equatorial Guinea from 1940 until 1969. From 1959, he was the head of the Centro Icunde in Bata, an adaptation and acclimatization station for animals and plants being sent to the botanical gardens in Barcelona. The Sabater P collection at the Barcelona University houses books, journals, drawings, and watercolors from fauna and flora, especially some exclusive material of primates and above all extensive research of snowflakes. Jordi Sabater P purchased the baby gorilla in 1966 from the farmer Benito Manie, who had called the gorilla in Fumo, which means white in the language of the Esangipang Benito Manie. The National Geographic had it in March 1967, Snowflake, the Animal Kingdom's newest celebrity. Life, Paris Match, the New York Times, Der Spiegel, and other newspapers followed. Snowflake became one of the most photo photographer animals in the world. When the albino gorilla was sent to the Barcelona Zoo, the gorilla was called officially in Fumo. But after his arrival at the Barcelona Zoo, Fumo was renamed as Snowflake. Nevertheless, the, the letter sent to the zoo by Jordi Sabater P. Sabater P purchased the gorilla uh, for 11,500 pesos. Some months later, he received a telegram from the direction of the World Exhibition, Expo 67 in Montreal, with an offer of $1 million. This states the desire and economic value of the albino gorilla. During my visits to the, uh, to the Sabater P collection, I studied specifically the drawings made in the research area of Equatorial Guinea and reflected with Emeritus Professor Jordi Sabater P about drawing, observation, per perception, projection, and imagination. Meanwhile, I start to capture all the images from the DVD El Mensch de Buxen am Floquet, and I made this collage, um, which represents the mass homage to the cult of this famous albino lowland gorilla and I reconsidered the migratory pattern. I reprinted the collection and redocumented the information in search of a physical condition. As a consequence of this collection, I start to prepare a drawing project in Equatorial Guinea, the country of origin of the albino gorilla. Paper boats depicting drawings from Barcelona Zoo were made and installed at the Barcelona beach to be photographed. The image was used for the communication of the project Flota and Fumo. From various historical, ecological, pedagogical angles, the project brought me to Bata. Reflection one, a drawing project reconsidering the consumer pattern from the Barcelona Zoo concerning archiving, drawing, and archiving a cultural remembrance in a digital era, and the event, incentive, and history to create a drawing collection with children. Reflection two, the gorilla space at the Barcelona Zoo informs about fragile environments of gorilla, questioning myself how the relation and perception towards this environment could be for local communities. Reflection three, the death of Snowflake was the start of a public debate. The albino gorilla being stuffed in the Museum of Natural History, displayed for future generations, or a decent burial as a citizen of honor in Catalonia or a repatriation to the country of origin, as Frank Westermann suggests in his book El Negro and Me, comparing El Negro de Bagnoles and Snowflake. Finally, on, only some genetic material and DNA from hair and bone samples are donated for uh, scientific purposes. This is another interpretation of an archive. Microscope slides from the melanin tear gain protected in Gembank, waiting and well conserved to make maybe a clone of the albino gorilla one day. My working period and experience in Barcelona ended in between a fascination uh, of the well-protected gene bank and the lost collection of children drawings. The second part of the whole project uh, is uh, developed in Bata Equatorial Guinea. So this brings me back to the consumer pattern versus the migratory pattern of the con and the country of origin. I didn't feel very enthusiastic to get into the discourse about pro and contra conservation techniques of an animal whose myth was created in Europe, neither the ethics of a biology department. 
starting from my artistic practice, I am more interested in the pedagogical efforts being made in relation to conservation. Opposite from the collection made by the Spanish children concerning snowflakes, my objective was to set up an intervention that would investigate of children drawings made by children in the region of Plata towards their own environment. The drawing project El Bosque y la Imaginación in June 2008, uh, a drawing project with the support and collaboration of the Centro Cultural Español en Bata was set up. I had assistance from uh, uh, the performance artist and choreographer Barbara Pereira, who has built up experience in the field of dance, theater, contemporary movement, and community arts in Europe and Latin America. We worked in Escuela Nana Mangue and in the rural school Nko and Toma, with a total of 275 students. The students, between 5 and 14 years old, were encouraged to make drawings of fauna and flora of their surroundings. They could draw whole ranges of different plants, trees, birds, insects, flowers, animals, clouds, and other natural phenomena. We ensured the students this was not an exam to make the best and most realistic drawings. We, uh, we were more interested in the surrounding environment. It could be characteristic, depiction, or emotional representation. We displayed some botanical drawings from the Sabata Tree Collection and drawings made by a group of botanists and artists in the National Park, Monte Allen. We showed examples of different drawing techniques with different media. The pedagogical approach of the drawing class was similar as I did before with, drawings pro with drawing projects with youngsters in Brussels, Berlin, or Novosibirsk. The drawings were exhibited at the Centro Cultural Español in Bata and afterwards redonated to the students who originally made them. During the second part of the workshop, we explained the story of Nfumungi, which means white gorilla, and who became Coquito de Nieve in, in Barcelona, Spain. The origami paper boat from the Barcelona beach depicting the children's drawings of snowflakes were used in the schools as a pedagogical tool and starting point as a tangible visualization to tell the story of Nfumo Ngi. The paper boats were given to the students. We displayed some copies of drawings from Sabata Tree Collection and from the children drawings made in Spain. We showed pictures of gorillas and the facilities in Barcelona Zoo and talked about the concept of a zoo, which is a very difficult task, because the zoo is a Western 19th century concept. The European menagerie evolved from a Victorian garden into the first uniform institution in a globalized world. A brief introduction for the teachers was set up uh, about the project Plata and Fumo. We, and we provided a pedagogical file, including books with drawings, photographs, and catalogs. After the drawing project, the teacher continued explaining the difference between zoos and the natural environment of animals, referring to the local region. I considering developing permanent artistic creative projects in the school curriculum as these can play a very important role for the introduction of team subjects and, learnings pro and learning processes. The final outcome of Plata and Fumo, I made a high resolution scan of each child's drawing in Bata. This digital collection of two seven two 275 drawings is my only trace of the drawing project in Bata. My final result and outcome is the way I approach and deal with the two archives. The digital collection El Nen Dibuxin en Flaque, created in the Barcelona Zoo, and El Bosque y la Imaginación, created in Bata, are reprinted. Exactly 4,800, no, 4,583 drawings, each separately as a high quality fine art reproduction, printed with inkjet decay technology on an acid free archival paper. <coughs> they are stored and exhibit in an archival system. Both archival systems will be presented next to each other or in relation to each other. It is a proportional model of what an archive can be or how an archive can be approached from different perspectives in different levels and different situations. Plata and Fumo is a reinterpretation of the content, form and meaning of an archive. The archive created through my interventions in Bata opposed to the archive created in the Barcelona Zoo, is not seen as a static terminal, but wants to open the discussion and reflection about the opportunities and possibilities of combining artistic approaches 
and playful educational formats in a pedagogical frame in multi-layered context and how to deal with storage and retrieving in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Philip. Our next speaker is Gail Hearn from Drexel University. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I too appreciate the opportunity to be here. I very much thank the organizers. This is a very exciting sort of conference, uh, particularly for someone like me who comes out of the biological sciences and a very different tradition than uh, even my co-panelists this morning. Um, but I think you can certainly understand the importance of the biological world, even to those who are not biologists. And actually that's more what I'm talking about than the biology of the situation. Um, I'm talking about biodiversity conservation. It is only on Bioko Island that I work, so um, this refers only to the island, not the mainland. People often ask me, why don't you work on the mainland, home of uh, Snowflake, who, by the way, I did know at the Barcelona Zoo because Snowflake was housed immediately adjacent to the collection of drills which is the monkey I'm most interested in. So um, yes, I too dodged missiles thrown by Snowflake, uh, as everybody who knew Snowflake well remembers. Snowflake had good aim, um, and it was an important thing to keep your eye on Snowflake. In any case, I'm gonna talk to you about biodiversity conservation. Um, many of you are familiar with Bioko Island, uh, part of Equatorial Guinea. For us biologists, it's important that it lies about 20 miles offshore from Cameroon, and it has been separated from the African mainland for only about 20, for about 12,000 years. Uh, the separation <laughs> caused by rising sea levels, something we're all interested in these days, that happened about 12,000 years ago. It's a relatively small island, only about uh, 2,000 kilometers, about 50 miles long, 20 miles wide, and it consists of three volcanic peaks, one of which, the one in the north, rises to almost 10,000 feet. So that's, that's quite a substantial vertical gain in a very small um, lateral distance. Has, of course, a very tropical climate, being only four degrees north of the equator. And at the southern end, down here I'm gonna use, if I can get it to, no, that didn't work. Uh, down here at the southern end, you see uh, relatively quite uninhabited. Down there we get about 36 or more feet of rain a year. Uh, the capital city and most of the people live up here on the northern and drier end of the island. There are two protected areas on the island, uh, Pico Basile National Park and the Gran Caldera Southern Highlands Scientific Reserve. Uh, they make up almost technically 40% of the island and almost all of the highlands, of course, of the island, but they um, have never had any real guards, so there has been absolutely no protection of them. A classic um, caper park, as they are called in conservation biology. The good thing for we conservation biologists is the fact that there are no roads and almost no people down here in this very wet part and very steep, um, very heavily forested part of the island. The beaches um, involve very large waves, heavy surf, jagged cliffs, and there are no good places to bring in a boat safely. So as a result of the high rainfall, rugged terrain, both uh, this part of the island and simply because of its altitude and the fact that it communications equipment for uh, the telecommunications equipment is up here on the top, mean that this northern part is also largely undisturbed. Uh, this is an idea of what it looks like in case you've never been there, and many people who've been in Malabo didn't realize this is here. These are the turtle beaches that we work on right here. Our turtle camp is right there. Um, 
This is the Gran Caldera de Luba, where we do our primate census. Those are the walls of the caldera, and you can see why hunters don't enter the caldera easily or take monkeys and other game back out easily. You may ask, why do we care so much about Bioko Island? Two main reasons, monkeys and sea turtles, both of which are highly endangered categories, both of which are what we call charismatic megavertebrates. It's easy to get public sympathy for these animals. In monkeys, there are seven species on the island. They are down in the southern part, still in high density. They are all classified as either endangered or critically endangered. Um, Bioko Island is considered to be the single most important place in Africa for primate conservation action by the official IUCN group that studies monkeys. I should also add that it is part of one of the 25 um, biological hotspots on the planet Earth. In other words, a place where if you save it, you save a disproportionate amount of biodiversity. We have four kinds of nesting sea turtles on the island. Uh, the main one is the leatherback, which are the biggest sea turtles, then green turtles, and also hawksbill and olive ridley. They nest in large numbers. It is clearly one of the African major nesting beaches for these turtles. I'm going to talk to you mostly about the monkeys because um, their situation is right now the most critical. And I'm going to introduce you to each of the seven species. The largest one is the drill monkey, second largest prime uh, monkey species in Africa. The great apes, chimps and gorillas, are larger. But among the monkeys, this is a very large monkey. It goes up to about 50 or 60 pounds for the males. Um, and still occurs in large numbers on Bioko Island, relatively large. It's getting exceedingly rare on the mainland. So we have the drill. We have two kinds of colobus monkeys. Colobus, these kinds of colobus do not keep at all in zoos. They cannot survive in zoos. So anybody who's looking to zoos to be the salvation of these animals, it's not possible. This is the black colobus, a prodigious uh, leaper who just dives over those cliffs and will sail you know, hundreds of feet through the air before hitting branches, missing, hitting more branches, missing again, and finally catching itself and charging off through the forest. This is the penance red colobus, and this is one of the Earth's rarest primates. It's been on the 25 most endangered primates list very regularly. We now realize that it is a separate species. This news has just come out. And I'd like to just kind of remind you that no primate species has gone extinct on the planet Earth, amazingly, for more than 100 years. And we've got one other red colobus that's close, but because it lives on the mainland, it's hard to make sure there isn't some pocket of it somewhere. That's an advantage about an island. Very, very clearly delimited territory. And once it's gone, it won't be too hard to prove that it's gone. And I wouldn't like Equatorial Guinea to, oh horrors, be the first country on the planet Earth to have an extinct primate and be considered to be the cause of it. So um, why do they go extinct so quickly? They're easy to shoot. They uh, tend to stand around and scream when they see a hunter, and hunters simply eliminate the whole family. There are four kinds of smaller branch-running monkeys, Cercopithecine monkeys. This is the most common, the russet-eared or red-eared monkey. This is another, the crowned Gwenin, a kind of punky little guy with a cute little mohawk. Uh, this is the putty-nosed monkey, has a very kind of bright white nose. And finally, a high-altitude monkey, Preuss's monkey, which is only in the highlands on the island. The only danger to the continued survival of wildlife on Bioko Island, the only danger right now, is commercial hunting for a bushmeat market in the capital city of Malabra. I want you to understand right from the beginning, bushmeat on Bioko Island makes up only a small part of 1% of the protein consumed on the island. And I should add, there's readily available and cheaper fish meat from Europe. Um, some of you have been in Malabo, some of you have been to the supermarket, and you can see neatly wrapped, just as they would be here, 
perfectly nice cuts of meat. So it is not for protein that people are paying so much money. It is rather a, um, a luxury item. Um, we keep track of Bioko's Wildlife, our organization, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, we monitor it both in the forests and in that marketplace. Um, in the marketplace, we have been keeping track now um, really just over 11 years. We have now gone over 130,000 dead things that, we, that come from the forest that we have pretty good documentation on. The monkeys make up 17% of those carcasses. The other common, the commonest one is this little gray diker, blue diker here, you see. Second most common is Eamon's giant pouched rat, this excellent little rodent that you see shown here. This is the old bushmeat market right here, and this is Reginaldo collecting information on each and every dead thing. It's important to realize, too, that it is shotgun hunting that captures the monkeys and now most of the dikers, not trapping. Trapping is something that uh, local residents might do to make a little bit of extra money or to feed their families. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is a clearly commercial shotgun hunting by organized hunters who um, are permitted to have the shotguns that they are using. This is a quick view of, the, of a drill for sale in the bushmeat market. Uh, drills, which might weigh 50 or 60 pounds, sell for over $200. So it's not a poor man's dinner. It's also not a pretty thing, and for many people, um, because of the close resemblance between primates and humans, particularly monkeys, great apes and humans, it can be a very uncomfortable place to visit. A little bit of science. Um, this is our record of primate dead things in the market. This is done by quarters of the year. And this is the pattern from 1997 when we started recording the number of dead things in the market up into 2008. And the thing you notice, because of the key, monkeys really are captured entirely by shotguns. So it's only the commercial hunters who have the shotguns. So it's the monkeys are being taken for a commercial market. I, I want to make that quite clear. Also, as we've seen um, wealth and other ability to pay go up in the capital city, we have seen that the monkey hunting has generally increased. If you look real carefully at these bars, you'll notice there's a sudden rise here. Uh, that is when we had a Bioko Biodiversity Roundtable sponsored by a number of organizations, including Conservation International. Word went out among the hunters that soon they would no longer be able to shoot monkeys. So monkey harvest went way up. I have corresponding graphs that I'm not going to bother to show you that show that diker hunting went down. In other words, they particularly tar were targeting monkeys during that period. Now, some of you also notice another one down here at the end. And that's when the number of monkey carcasses dropped dramatically in the market. That's when there was a ban, a presidential decree banning the hunting, uh, consumption, and possession of primates throughout Equatorial Guinea. It had an immediate effect, but unfortunately, when it was not enforced, the effect was quite short-lived. This is a close-up of the same thing. Looks complicated. Just pay attention to the tops of the bars. The multicolored is just the different species of monkey that made up the bar. Here was when the ban went into effect, right here at the end of October. And now you can see what happened monthly, rose, a little bit of uncertainty, and now it is up to at least as high a level. Since it is illegal to sell them, most of these are now being sold clandestinely, and when you do that, the price goes up. We're having trouble keeping track of the price, but it is also skyrocketing. Further evidence that this is not something that poor people engage in, nor is it anything that has anything to do with human basic health or welfare. If anything, in the human health category, of course, these monkeys carry some pretty bad diseases. Um, and so I certainly wouldn't want them in my kitchen, <laughs> but um, that's another matter. Okay, let's look at a happier thing, which is uh, the situation in the wild. And again, I'm going to emphasize the good things here because there's no sense beating you guys. You're mostly from the humanities. It's not your fault. 
over the heads with this. So I'm going to present nice data. This is the places where we run patrols and where we routinely census in an annual expedition each year. Uh, we've been keeping track of monkeys and wildlife in the Gran Caldera de Luba down here for 18 years. I first went to the island in 1990. Um, and more recently, we've been keeping track of forest animals along the beaches here along the southern coast. These are to the same scale. Up here in the caldera, the original census in 1990, we got about 1.7 primate group encounters per kilometer of census trail walk. And basically, as you look across the years, that's held reasonably steady. There are no statistical differences in these different years. So basically, what we are seeing is that if you patrol an area, we know it's been hunted several times and then sometimes fairly intensively since then, but if you have people in there patrolling, no, no guns or anything, just walking the trails, not all the time, just from time to time, it has a passive protective effect. Hunters tend to stay away. They're uncomfortable hunting where others will see them. Down at the beach trails, which are farther from the hunters and harder to access because of, we also run turtle beach patrols and it's a difficult coast to land a boat on, um, the numbers are even higher. We only have six of the seven species along the beach, not that high altitude one, but you can see numbers are very good down along the coast. So the good news here is if you take action, um, these animals can be saved and even now are to an extent being saved. But with the prices so high, I really wonder how long we can hang on with these uh, particular mechanisms. What are we doing, or who is we when I say we? Uh, we created in 1999 something called the Bioco Biodiversity Protection Program, and it's part of the partnership between Drexel University and UNHE, the National University of Equatorial Guinea. We're not an NGO, and that may help us kind of operate under the radar. Uh, we're not trying to browbeat anybody, including government or oil companies, into doing what we feel is the right thing. We're trying to show what is the right thing. We're trying to help everybody see what's the right thing, and we're hoping people take our lead. Uh, we have a website, uh, bioco.org, and we do direct conservation. We raise the money and pay the local patrols who walk the forests and the beaches and keep help my students keep track of what's going on. Um, we work hard with the public on the island, and we try to work hard with the government. We produce reports that explain the situation at fairly regular intervals, and of course we include their university professor and students in all of our work. Um, we also do educational things. We are a university after all. We run fac faculty workshops. Particularly, I want to draw your attention to our Drexel study abroad on Bioko Island. Um, each fall and spring, we bring American undergraduates, groups of eight, to Equatorial Guinea for a semester um, on the beaches, up in the highlands, and uh, in Malabo. If you know of any sophomores or juniors who could benefit, we would be very happy. So um, that's my little pitch. I have some handouts if you want them, and I'll be very happy to share some information about that. We also train patrols. We do outreach to schools. We do all the standard conservation stuff. In addition to our own research, we now have a new field station up in the Mocha Highlands. We uh, host guest scientists, and we are keeping baseline meteorological data now in anticipation of climate change. Two of these things are particularly important and I want to emphasize here. One is the public and government relations. The other is our field station. For the government and public relations, one of our major strategies right now is working to convince the government of Equatorial Guinea that protecting, seriously protecting, Bioko Islands monkeys and other wildlife is important and that hunting ban should be reinforced. We have written reports and we also have pretty good validation. We were the subject of a 22-page um, spread in National Geographic last August uh, for the American edition, I think in January for the Spanish edition. Uh, that's pretty good validation that this, this is an important island, okay? 
We're also trying to convince the government that they would want to help us with our field station that we in UNHE have established up in the Mocha Highlands where we bring scientists and our students and their students have the opportunity to work together. A nice field station up there would bring a lot of recognition and prestige to their country. Uh, why do we think we might be successful? Because Bioko Island offers some really unusual things in conservation, low human population, only one threat to the wildlife, and that's the hunting of the larger forest animals. The land isn't suitable for logging or farming. The government has some money. You know, in other words, it's not like these really poor countries where they have no money that they could even put towards it if they had it. They have some money. This won't cost much. And we hope, because they keep talking about ecotourism as their future, tourists don't come to view empty forests. They come to view wildlife. And this is the most uh, unusual wildlife the country has to offer. And coupled with what they have on the mainland could make a very attractive uh, tourist package. We think we also are perhaps more appealing than some of the pure conservation groups because we have a long-term educational collaboration. We're trying to give back. We're trying to raise up the people who will hopefully soon take over from we expats so that this will not be um, an expat-run situation and increasingly will be you know, quite a Ghanaian-run situation. I want to emphasize that this isn't just about the monkeys. There are flagship species, but it's about the other primates, like the four species of bush babies, little galagos that live on the island. It's about the reptiles, like this chameleon. It's about the arachnids, like this elegant little spider. It's about the insects, like this katydid. It's about the flora and the fauna. I think Bioko's island biodiversity is definitely worth saving. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Our next speaker is Laureano Corses. Come. I have not announced everybody's paper title, but I trust you all are looking at the paper titles in your program. a bit of difficulty with the... Uh, Didn't explain my name. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit... <laughs> Actually, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and especially the coordinators for imagining um, an interdisciplinary panel like this. And I'm hoping that my talk, which is on theatrical representation in some way, I mean, clearly it will connect, you'll see, one of the characters is Pepito de Nieve, but I hope that additional ideas will float about as we explore how two plays by Juan Mayorga shed light on citizenship and immigration, particularly on how the naturalization of individuals and their roles in the adopted society is informed by the relationship industrialized nations have had and continue to have with Africa and Latin America. Um, I'm analyzing two plays, La Tortuga de Darwin, which uh, we'll just refer to as Darwin the Turtle, and Las Ultimas Palabras de Copito de Nieve, The Last Words of Copito de Nieve, which we will call Last Words. Um, we can better understand the relationship between the industrialized nation and the other who enters its territory in by seeing both of these plays. At the same time, these works beckon us to go beyond the texts to consider issues such as sustainability regarding the homelands from where the immigrants and refugees hail. In both plays, Mallorca has given animal protagonist roles. In the first play, the turtle brought back to the Galapagos Islands, and in the second, Copito de Nieve, the famous gorilla we've been talking about from Equatorial Guinea, uh, who is brought to the Barcelona Zoo. Both texts reveal ways in which Europe assimilates the other, and in both instances, the presence of the foreigner in the midst of European society is mainly for the benefit of Europe. Yet Mayorga seems to posit 
that the dialogue with the other is necessary in the West as it enriches our knowledge and refines our ways of seeing. Um, he is quite a successful playwright. Um, he was very recently honored with the Premio Bainclan, which is one of Spain's most prestigious theatrical awards. And earlier this week, he actually won the Max uh, de las Artes Escenicas um, for a specific play, Por la Paz per Perpetua, where he also uses animals in key roles. Um, Mayorga's use of animals as main characters in several of his plays hints at the possibility that the discourse on difference and the interrelationship of different populations might be expanded by the fable. In the specific case of Darwin's turtle and Copito de Nieve, non-European animals are transferred from the margins to share their ideas on European experience. These texts underscore the process by which contemporary European nations look beyond their borders to redefine the cultural identities, their cultural identities, and to gain a better understanding of their future. In both plays, the fable is used as an allegory where the other's discourse is an element in the way that European nations, and specifically Spain, imagines itself. However, it is important to understand that these are not works that stage fables in the classical sense of the term, for not all of the characters are animals. The structure of the fable informs the creation of the protagonist, an animal, but the other characters are human. And this could be viewed as something that's problematic, perceived as a, a dangerous conceit, a dramatic device that reaffirms the most negative notions of Latin America and Africa. But this is not exactly what, what happens here. Europe does not emerge as a superior society. Moreover, in the personification of Darwin's turtle and Copito, the allegorical animals are successfully humanized. They emerge as subjects who have lived along with humans, yet do not share their destructive tendencies. To be clear, the portrayals of the protagonist are rendered in a most positive light. It's also important, I think, to keep in mind that in both plays we are dealing with subjects who truly existed, yet who are tangential to European history. They are inserted in European experience as a result of European plans. In the case of Darwin's turtle, the scientific advancement of the 19th century. And in the case of Copito, the creation of the zoo as part of an urban experience. So clearly their identities are inextricably linked to imperialism, to the colonial exploits Europe and Latin America, uh, in, in Latin America and Africa. Moreover, in transferring these characters to the center of the action, Mayorga illuminates a threshold the space where Europe meets Latin America and Africa. We cannot help but have our thoughts go beyond the text to remember the colonial history. These texts reveal that the relationship between the nation and any subject is never unilateral. Like Caliban in The Tempest, who uses the language he was taught to curse the teacher, both the turtle and Copito feel that they have not been treated well by the West. Both serve to remind an often too comfortable West that the injustices of the past translate to the relationships we presently have with immigrant populations. Mayorga is questioning our socially determined definitions of true belonging while considering that the categorization of insiders and outsiders which as George Simmel suggests, also poses fundamental questions about the nature of what we understand in the modern world to be our inalienable, in, inalienable rights and liberties. And I'll clo close that quote. Therefore, we're dealing with texts that address perhaps one of the most important questions contemporary society faces, namely the challenge of expanding to others the rights of a national citizen. So at another level, these texts may be read as allegories 
on belonging and the way the categories of insider and outsider are institutionalized through citizenship. While they depict a European reality, I also believe that what is expressed in both plays is not exclusive to European society, but also speaks of relationships, say, uh, between Latin America and the United States and Africa and the United States. In Darwin's Turtle, Harriet the Turtle has been in Europe for close to 200 years. Having arrived with Darwin in the 1830s, yet there is no reference in, in the play to her being a citizen of any European nation. One can conclude that she does not have a legal status in Spain. Actually, she arrives on the scene as a woman turtle, having evolved further in that 200 uh, year period. And she volunteers to help a history professor by providing eyewitness accounts to much of what transpired in European history. Perhaps it is her status as an illegal immigrant that she places, that places her in a situation where she is used by the professor and also by a doctor who conducts experiments on her for the benefit of European knowledge. And what's interesting is once again, these creation of archives that are constantly coming up and where, uh, to what degree, um, these comparisons can be made in different uh, types of archives. It seems that her presence in Europe is mostly, once again, to the benefit of Europe. Her longevity has allowed her to witness important moments in European history, but has not granted her citizenship. She has been separated from her place of origin, mainly because the study of its flora and fauna are key to evolutionary theory. However, in last words, we have a very different situation. Copito is a Spanish citizen. His status is clearly described in the play by the zoo guard. But the word guardian, guardian in Spanish, quickly reminds us of the similarities between the zoo and the prison. Copito belongs to the city, especially or specifically Barcelona, yet the city has full control of his life. In a sense, he is imprisoned for a crime that he did not commit. He too has been deprived of the possibility of a real connection with the natural world of his homeland in Equatorial Guinea. Hence, the process of naturalization may be viewed as a process of erasure. In the play, Copito does not make any references to Africa. He essentially addresses philosophical topics. He mentions Socrates and Kierkegaard, among other Western philosophy, philosophers. Moreover, through a reference to another African animal, the giraffe in the zoo, we are informed that nostalgia for the homeland is not welcome. Um, the giraffe is being given sedatives because it has grown melancholic, because it remembers its homeland, because it has begun to speak in verse. Once again, the allegory points to a reality where the subject serves the city, but gets little in return. Despite Copito's unique situation as a privileged citizen, one who enjoys celebrity status, all moments of his life, including his death by euthanasia, are controlled by the state. Therefore, the very notion of citizenship, the ideas regarding rights and individual freedom that are so inextricably linked to the social contracts of modern nations is put into question by these fables. In an article about rethinking the archive and the colonial library for Equatorial Guinea, Benita San Pedro sees Copito de Nieve as an example of the obsession, humane fauna, that the West has with Guinean fauna. And she includes a poem by Francisco Zamora Loboche, where he uses irony to describe Copito's life in Spain and where he posits that his success is due to his wifeness. Copito is an albino gorilla. Samora Loboch describes a subject who has abandoned the jungle, who now eats filet of sole. And in Mayorga's play, Copito's whiteness is also addressed. He shares a cage in 
the dramatic representation, right? With a black gorilla who is described as a sin papeles, without a legal status in Spain. And Gobito states that the black gorilla is there to highlight his whiteness, to serve as a point of comparison in evidencing his extraordinary nature. Unlike Copito, the illegal immigrant does not share lofty thoughts. Right? He does not speak of philosophers, but rather spends all of his time addressing basic necessities. Here, non-citizenship is represented as synonymous with the unknown, a status where the subject is defined by the projections of European cliches and anxieties. The guard describes the illegal gorilla as a synecdote for Africa. And his definition of Africa is not based on knowledge, but rather prefabricated images. As he observes Copito's page mate, he states, Africa, la fuerza de lo elemental, sonidos primordiales, cielos rojos, horizontes infinitos. Bueno, yo no he estado. En vacaciones, mi señora siempre pre prefiere Europa, por si acaso uno se enferma, preferiblemente España, por si caes mal, para entenderte con el médico. Africa, with, all, with its primal force, primordial sounds, red skies, infinite horizons. Well, I haven't been there because when it comes to vacations, my wife prefers Europe in case one gets sick, preferably Spain, so you can understand the doctor. The decision to not travel to Africa for health reasons is voiced in the zoo which the guard considers a safer urban space, specifically one where part of Africa has been transferred for European consumption. Copito exists to be seen, but he is no longer in his original context. To a great degree, this serves as an allegory of the West's relationship with Africa, one where its nations are approached superficially and interest is linked to what can be taken out of Africa. In both plays, we do not have a discourse that is rooted in the homelands of the protagonists. And this is interesting, for it mirrors a reality where the West ex essentially ignores African and Latin American discourses. Questions that would help these less developed regions of the world are not raised in these texts. Clearly, it was not the intention of Mayorga to write about Latin America or Africa. Yet the protagonists hail from these spaces. In the case of Darwin's turtle, her longevity and experience in, Eu in Europe authorize her to speak about the continent. The professor welcomes her eyewitness accounts and is willing to include this information in a historical context. Yet in the case of Copito, the discourse is essentially an appropriation as he quotes from Western philosophy. It is also interesting to note that Copito is quickly entangled in the national debates of Spain, where he has to clarify that he, a citizen of Barcelona, had never felt rivalry toward the panda in the Madrid Zoo. Therefore, in the case of the African animal, we witness how quickly discourse is monopolized. Mallorca does not allude to the shorter lifespan of the gorilla and presents the animal's last moments. So in the specific case of Copito, his discourse is also limited by his precarious condition. That being said, Copito does offer last words of advice that we will get to soon. But in general, like the giraffe in the play, the West seems to want to take sedatives whenever the challenges and difficult realities of Latin America and Africa are brought to the fore. The more industrialized nations still define their contact with these regions or often define their contact based on resources. Yet despite the wealth in natural resources in these native lands, refugees continue to arrive on European shores. And we have just seen animals are still on the verge of extinction. To simply view the situation within the context of the land of adoption will not result in decisions that foster sustainable development. 
Hence, it is essential to consider immigration while considering the reality of the nations from which these populations hail. In picturing sustainable development, the lives of citizens must be viewed within a greater picture. They must play an active role in any project that attempts to save the environment. Juan Mayorga sees one of theater's main missions as revealing contradictions. And in both plays, he has remained true to this mission. Undoubtedly, the relationships that Europe has had with less fortunate neighbors has often been defined by contradiction. In Darwin's Turtle, the turtle sees man devolving over time. Much of this negative perception has to do with the way our societies treat others and also with the continued destruction of the environment. And what's interesting is that clearly all of the examples are from European history. So the turtle sees the Spanish Civil War, the bombing of Guernica, um, the rise of fascism in Europe, but uh, the focus is essentially a European focus. So, but at the same time, despite the focus on Europe, another discourse is emerging in these plays. One where when animals speak, it becomes clearer that humans are not the center and that no one space is the center of global society, that there is interrelationship between all populations, all flora and fauna, and that we must preserve the delicate balance. Gopito's last words of advice involve genuine life. He simply says, change your lives, take your masks off and stop with hypocrisy. Perhaps expanding our awareness to truly include the experience of others, and clearly this, what's interesting about this play is it's been answering this, the expansion of, it's, not, it's no longer only about human subjects, although this is just the first and very rather rudimentary um, step forward. It's gonna be become increasingly interesting to see to what degree geopolitics comes in. Um, and this is a first step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laureano. Now I think you can see why we slightly rearranged our presentations here because it all fits together very well and you can see that last paper tied the previous two together as well. I would now like to open up our um, discussion and just to remind everyone that you should please come to the uh, microphone there so that everybody can hear your questions and that we do want to use this as an opportunity to uh, increase our mutual education and uh, increase our dialogue and respect for one another. So please now uh, bring your questions forward and we hope that you will address each of the panelists, that they'll each get a chance to comment on your questions. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Thanks very much for your uh, interesting presentations. I'd like to ask a question to Miss Dr. Karen. No? Yeah. As, um, as a biologist, um, I would like to know, well, first, you mentioned that uh, people are not eating this um, bush meat because of its nutritional value, because they, they could obtain uh, these proteins uh, from other sources. So I'd like to know if you have thoughts about the considerations of the cultural value of this meat, because I think this is one of the main problems, why people are eating this meat, why they, why they value this meat so much, and that's one of the things that probably might be harder to, to change. And the second question is about the, um, it's related to the first one, is, is, is about the e ecotourism as an alternative. Uh, maybe the, this could uh, create some different level of awareness about the value of biodiversity and so on. But uh, regarding ecotourism, I know that uh, biologists, or I get the impression that biologists usually have mi mixed feelings about, about this alternative. So I'd like to know what's your position on this as well. Thank you. 
Okay, first a little bit about the cultural importance of bushmeat. There's no doubt that particularly in certain of the ethnic groups that uh, live in Equatorial Guinea, it is considered very important. Um, and I think that we once considered uh, in this country eating whales um, to be a, an important thing to do and some of the other species that are either gone or at least endangered. I'm not actually against hunting. Um, it's hunting to extinction that concerns me. And at the rate they're hunting the Oco Islands wildlife, another 10 or 15 years, it won't matter. They won't have anything to eat that comes from the forest anyway. So really, I'm trying to protect that cultural tradition. If, they, if people wish to, primates are particularly dangerous to eat, but if they wish to eat wildlife from the forest, I'm certainly not against that. Um, but soon they will have nothing to eat unless they do a better job of regulating the offtake rate. So uh, I hope that answers it. I certainly do understand, and I'm just asking all people uh, who might be eating or capturing bushmeat to consider the long-term consequences. And uh, now is the time to stop, not when it's too late. So that, that was the, the first question. And your second question was about tourism. Um, I'm like all biologists. It, it's not 100% a good thing. But you have to give value to wildlife. We shouldn't have to. It provides a tremendous number of, unfortunately, free goods and services to mankind. And we fail to realize that uh, they're not going to be there forever. One way to help bring value to wildlife is through things like ecotourism. Um, the Oco Island in particular is not an easy ecotourist place, even if the government were positive and friendly toward tourists, which if any of you are recently back and have been fingerprinted and photographed, as seems to be happening a lot now, um, it doesn't have that warm and friendly feeling as you come to the airport. Um, so I think that even if it were made warm and friendly, you'd only get a certain kind of ecotourist because it rains a lot. And it's really, that's not what most tourists have in mind for their vacation. So you'd have to combine it. In the first place, it would be limited pretty much to the dry season. And you'd have to combine it, I think, with a visit to the mainland because the uh, flora and fauna are very, very different. They're in different biological regions. So in one country, you could see all kinds of different things. Um, and, and so I think there's potential there, and I don't think you'd ever have huge crowds. So in that sense, I think it's, it's quite possible. You would be picking off the upper end ecotourist who was adding to their life lists of primates and birds and things, not, not your kind of average, even your average Costa Rican ecotourist. Hope that answers it. Do we have another question? Yes, well, I'll open it up for our <laughs> panelists to at least uh, talk to one another. Is there pleasant need um, a structure that would allow for ecotourism, either to grow from the present number or the three minutes? I think in terms of lodging, because yeah. are there possibilities that can be expanded on? Where are we right now? Um, on, on Bioko Island, there are increasingly nice hotels um, that might house ecotourists. I think there's still a tremendous problem in uh, getting around the island. It's much better than it used to be. Um, up in Mocha, where we have this new field station, there there is no hotel. Uh, it would, I mean, there is there there is a possibility of a hotel, but it doesn't seem to have opened, and we've been waiting a couple years. And that would help us. And there's rumors that there's going to be a hotel uh, basically inside the uh, protected area up at the edge of Lago Biao. And that, that also, although rather remote, um, would provide housing for tourists. That's a problem. They can only make a day trip. Um, we have occasionally helped people um, go down to the southern coast, but it's a very difficult hike. Um, probably not worth developing it much more because of the huge rainfall. Um, so it will always be a specialist thing, and the specialist tourists who would come would be those tourists who are not looking for too um, easy or too civilized 
and experience. So it's a case of working with there are some East African tourist agencies that specialize more in the adventure tourism or the off the beaten path tourism. That would be the way I think you'd have to go because it's never going to be a big tourist destination, but it could be a destination for very well healed tourists. But there's a lot to uh, there's a long way to go in uh, hospitality training. Although I will say that I think the people that you deal with on Bioko Islands are naturally very hospitable. So you don't have to train them to be nice. They are nice, and they're very welcoming. So it's more a matter of explaining to the people who'd be working in the tourist industry what tourists expect, rather than trying to teach them, which is a much harder thing. You have to be nice to these strangers, even though you might not like them. No, they always seem to be very, very nice to all of us. And to any student I bring from sometimes all kinds of parts of the planet Earth, um, these are just people who are very friendly, open, and uh, eager to make new friends. So I don't have to re you know, kind of restructure a whole culture to see something happening here. Local people, I think, would be great. A uh, little bit of hospitality training, and I, I think the government would have to work on that because it has to do with things like the way you come through the airport, the way you get access to hotels, um, things like that. And the fact that I like it that there are no credit cards in the country, but it's a little hard on tourists. Um, there are kind of limitations on how much money you can bring in. Hotels are exceedingly expensive. So you're almost a criminal even before you pass ca you know, passport control. I have another question. <laughs> um, what what kind of uh, efforts does your organization make to uh, communicate and inform the local community or the local, uh, like people from Malabo? Because I think they're also interested in the fauna and flora. And yeah, like maybe there is a, this off the beaten tourist who can reach this part of the country. But sometimes I think there are also there's an interest of local people as well in this unaccessible part and so I am wondering what is uh, we, we try to keep um, in touch with everybody in the Malabo community for example uh, the new Sofitel um, hotel in Malabo is going to be having a reception uh, in honor of Earth Day and they're going to be featuring uh, some of the work we've been doing and the wildlife center that we've established now up at MOCA. And so uh, we hope that receptions like that, uh, we also have a, uh, an exposition of the research by our students at the Spanish Cultural Center each semester that we try to publicize. Um, so we try to get the word out among all the various communities that make up Malavo um, of what we're doing and the importance of the wildlife. But we're always open to new suggestions, and we're always happy to take new American students over there. Thank you. Next. <coughs> yes, this is a question for, for Philip. Uh, I mean, very much like the question you asked uh, uh, Gail, uh, what was the reception of your projects in Malabo and Bata? And the, this just ties to a second question. Is there any plans to develop an archive in, for instance, in Bata uh, to historicize the, the history of, of, of the consumption of nature <laughs> that was practiced during colonial times, or even now with, uh, with uh, issues of uh, uh, ecotourism. But the question is, how was your project uh, received uh, in, yeah, in that's Bata? Yeah, why I asked also the question, because for me, like all this, uh, youngsters they they uh, they can't go or make an effort to to visit like the interior or and they are very well interested in their fauna and flora and in their wildlife as well and there is like a, a really uh, curiosity to to knowledge and to know all these kind of things so if i go to zoos in in europe or in the states and they have all these well-informed uh, centers and interpretation centers. I think it's really interesting, like in Bata or in Malabo, to have something like this, but also like in a historical context and ecological context to explain about their local uh, 
environment. And that's really a lack. And I think this is really something uh, people has to work on or like just, yeah, in, a, in an interdisciplinary d uh, approach with local communities, but uh, also with organizations who has uh, all the statistics and who are doing like field research, but just to inform and to make it accessible also to the people from the cities uh, in Bata and Malabo. Yes, please come. <coughs> I will ask in Spanish because my English is, is very bad. Um, quería saber, no sé si tiene que ver algo, es un tema marginal, las tortugas que anidan en el sur de la isla de Bioko y parece ser las que anidan en la isla de Corisco. Queríamos saber el origen, la migración de, esta tu, de estas tortugas, si de dónde proceden. Parece ser, mi impresión, es que proceden de, de Brasil y que realizan un trayecto de Brasil al, al Golfo de Guinea y anidan en el, en el sur de la isla de Bioko. Y si ustedes han hecho un estudio sobre, un seguimiento sobre este proceso, porque tan importante es hacer el estudio de la, de la conservación en el sitio de nidificación como en todo el proceso que siguen las tortugas de Brasil, si fuera así, del lugar de origen a Guinea, bueno, la costa del Golfo de Guinea. Gracias. He's referred to two species of turtles, one um, that apparently nests in Bioko and um, migrates to Brazil, and then another in another, I believe, island, Orisco. O Orisco and would like to know if you have studied these turtles in their migratory patterns or in, in general. Uh, thank you. Thank you for asking about the turtles, because we have a really good turtle project that I didn't mention. Um, we have only, we don't know where the turtles that nest on Bioko Southern beaches come from or on where they uh, spend their time when they're not actually breeding and nesting which is, you probably know, but maybe others don't, turtles, uh, sea turtles tend to return to nest only every three or four years. So everybody wonders where do they go in between. Um, the ones we're studying most intensely right now are the leatherbacks, the big ones. And uh, we have pit tagged all of the, the, which means that you put a passive uh, transmitter in the turtle. And so you can come up with a reader and you can tell exactly what turtle that is. And um, the interesting thing was not one of those leatherbacks had any tags or any pit tags on it. Now, we know the Spanish did tag turtles back in the mid-1990s, but those tags all dropped off in a year or two. What we do know now is that those turtles aren't turning up probably anywhere else right now on the planet Earth because almost all turtles now have pit tags in them. <laughs> We're so industriously tagging them. And the fact that none of them did, this means this is a population that's separate. We don't know where they go when they're not um, nesting on Bioko's beaches, but we know they're probably a separate population from other turtles. Um, same is probably true of the greens, although if that was one of the species, and I missed that, um, they may be also sharing a common population with the ones that nest uh, at Corisco, which is the island close to the mainland. And um, that's more to the south. So that may be a population that uh, kind of lives in the Gulf of Guinea. We don't know much about them. We're doing a health assessment right now, a uh, really fancy one, on the leatherbacks. And they look pretty healthy, but we don't have all the chemistry back. Um, so that it's, it's not only a, the main threat to the turtles, by the way, comes from big fishing boats. Um, the government of Equatorial Guinea, at least some branch of it, does routinely issue permits for capturing green turtles that the turtle poachers carry down to the southern beaches. And it would be good if that stopped because they are under the impression that each nest is a separate turtle. And actually, a turtle will return to nest eight to 10 times. So you can divide the number of nests by five to 10 to get the actual number of turtles, which is, of course, obviously much, much lower. So even taking a few turtles from the very decimated populations on the southern coast um, is now a bad thing. And of course, they are endangered species, and there are CITES agreements and things that say that you shouldn't issue permits to capture endangered species. 
So it would be good if the poaching that still exists were to stop entirely. However, the great danger to all the sea turtles comes from entanglement in fishing gear and things like that. And as you probably realize, there's a lot of fishing going on off um, Bioko Island. And it, it is not artisanal fishermen from Bioko Island. It's big factory ships, um, often from China. So there are other problems that uh, have nothing to do with what goes on on the beaches. But uh, we don't know much about the turtles, but they are really valuable turtles. That's what we do know. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question for our panelists? Well, please join me in thanking them for a really wonderful presentation that really shows us the relationship between the arts and science. I'd like to invite you now for a short coffee break and coffee will be served upstairs. So please come up and feel free to engage our panelists further. Those of you who are too shy to come up to the mic, uh, join us for coffee upstairs. Thank you.